Tonight, the federal government restores millions of dollars in funding to Hockey Canada. It's not a blank check. Months after controversy over how it handled sexual assault allegations cost its sponsors and support, a new promise of taxpayer cash and the conditions that come with it. Fox News prepares to defend itself in court over what it said about a Canadian company after the U.S. election. The cynicism and the outright lying is so crazy here. And the final bow for Broadway's longest running show, we're backstage as the Phantom of the Opera prepares its final act. You're going out with a bit. Absolutely. You're going out with a chandelier Yes, drop. we are. Yeah. This is The National with David Common. Thanks for joining us. Ian is away. The federal government is giving Hockey Canada another shot tonight, nearly a year after pulling all funding, slamming how the organization handled sexual assault allegations. The money is now back, but with conditions. It's a major move after months of controversy for the national body that regulates the sport. After revelations, it used registration fees to settle cases of alleged sexual assault. Since then, Hockey Canada's entire board of directors has been replaced. But tonight, the federal minister of sport says this restored funding is not a blank check. Marina von Stackelberg now on the changes that led to this moment and what may still need to change. It's all or nothing now. One game to go at the Women's World. As Canada's national women's hockey team played for gold, the announcement came. Hockey Canada will once again receive millions of taxpayer dollars. When we suspended the funding for Hockey Canada, it was never a matter of doing it forever. It was so that the proper change was implemented in the organization. Sports Minister Pascal Saint-Ange froze Hockey Canada's funding 10 months ago, after the organization's top brass wouldn't answer questions at a parliamentary committee about how they had handled sexual assault allegations. <laughs> It was revealed the organization used registration fees to settle a sexual assault case from 2018. In that incident, a young woman alleged eight hockey players sexually assaulted her after a Hockey Canada gala. It's not a blank check. We're going to ask them to report uh, the situation constantly with Sport Canada. We want to make sure that the, they, they keep on going in the right direction. To get its money back, Hockey Canada had to sign on with the new Sport Integrity Commissioner, which independently investigates abuse complaints. It also had to pass an audit to prove it didn't use government money to pay out settlements over the last four years. In a statement, Hockey Canada Board Chair Hugh Fraser writes, Today marks an important milestone for Hockey Canada in our journey to earn and maintain the trust of Canadians. I also wish to stress that we still have work to do to change the culture of our sport. The head of Hockey Canada and the sport minister appeared side by side for a TSN interview against the backdrop of the women's game. The optics aren't great. This is not the time to be rewarding Hockey Canada. This sport expert says everyone's eyes will be on whether the organization follows through. Sports Canada has been very good at establishing standards for funded sports bodies, but terrible at uh, reviewing them for compliance. And Marina, there are strings attached to this funding. Take us through that. Yeah, well, to keep its funding, Hockey Canada must regularly update the federal government on the work it's doing to change its culture, bring in recommendations of two different reports, and promote the government's safe sport program for athletes. Now, before it withheld the funding, Ottawa gave Hockey Canada just shy of $8 million last fiscal year. In total, the organization ended that year with $98 million, making it the richest sports organization in the country. Marina von Sackelberg, thanks very much. As Marina mentioned, Canada's women's hockey team was going for gold tonight in the IIHF World Women's Championship Final. We'll have more on the result and take a closer look at the state of women's hockey a little later. For two full days now, Sudan's army has been fighting, sometimes street to street, against a powerful rival paramilitary group. At least 59 civilians are dead. And as Sarah Levitt explains, hopes for democracy or even stability in the country are on hold as people run for cover. 
chaos as fighting breaks out on the streets of Khartoum, civilians running for their lives. <laughs> Unverified video shows others taking cover at the airport. On the tarmac, airplanes burn. In the sky, fighter jets carry out devastating airstrikes. The headquarters of the Sudanese armed forces now just a shell. The country torn apart in a power struggle between the paramilitary group known as the Rapid Support Force and Sudan's army. The capital has been plunged into darkness, civilians searching for information. The electricity is out, no internet is barely working, um, and they're all kind of just staying away from windows and things because of stray gunshots. It has been very stressful and very frightening. Hamid Khalafala sheltered with his family in his home as shrapnel from an artillery shell hit an outside wall. With no very clear vision on what's going to happen next and no clear information on what exactly is going on. In 2019, democracy in Sudan appeared to be on the horizon. Protests against longtime leader Omar al-Bashir led to his ousting. But any hopes of a civilian government were dashed by a coup in 2021. Two armies were behind it, one under General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, the other, the RSF, under Mohammed Hamdan Dagolo. They were in the process of negotiating a merge of those two forces. What we saw just in the last two days is a breakdown in those talks as various factions of the security services squared off against each other, uh, fearing that one side was going to be gaining an upper hand uh, over the other. An upper hand involving fighting on the street, Dozens of civilians killed, hundreds injured, a brief ceasefire mostly ignored. Absolutely nowhere a part of this conversation are those civilians who are supposed to ultimately be running this country. Now Canada, the U.S., the African Union and others are calling for an end to the hostilities, worried the violence could spread and it could spiral into an all-out civil war. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. An assassination live on television has stunned many in India tonight. A former politician convicted of kidnapping was gunned down along with his brother while surrounded by police. We aren't showing the shooting itself, but experts say it highlights a much bigger issue. This was the scene before shots rang out. Former Indian politician and accused gangster Atik Ahmed on the right, along with his brother Ashraf, both in custody, being led by police into a hospital for a checkup. The press was there. In the crowd, so were three gunmen. They fired at point blank range, killing Atik first, then Ashraf. Chaos ensued, but the shooters didn't get away. They quickly surrendered. The whole scene raising serious questions and suspicions for many. Why was he transported uh, late at night? Why was the press invited? Uh, why did 17 cops were absolutely unable to do anything to prevent uh, his uh, killing? Atik Ahmed was a notorious figure, a politician with a Robin Hood image who helped the poor. But he was also accused in at least 100 criminal cases, convicted of kidnapping. Some experts say his murder fits a pattern over the last few years in Uttar Pradesh state where suspects and people have been charged or awaiting trial or pending cases um, have been shot, killed by police, so-called encounters. Uh, there have been many who have died in police custody as well. Opposition parties are accusing the government of ruling by fear. The government has ordered a judicial probe, but also restricted gatherings and cut internet access. It was under that cloud and tight security that mourners came together tonight to bury the brothers. CBC is the latest media company to be slapped with a controversial label by Twitter. The social media site added government-funded media on the official at CBC account tonight. Twitter defines that as outlets that may have some degree of government involvement over editorial content. In a statement, CBC says that is clearly not the case with CBC Radio-Canada, adding CBC Radio-Canada is publicly funded through a parliamentary appropriation that is voted upon by all members of parliament. Its editorial independence is protected in law. The move by Twitter comes after both NPR and PBS in the United States were labeled this way and then stopped tweeting. The BBC's label was eventually changed to publicly funded media.
Now to a highly anticipated trial involving the most watched cable news network in America and a company with Canadian roots. It was supposed to start tomorrow, but late tonight, a surprising and sudden delay by the judge. Katie Simpson sets up what's at stake. It's hard to trust anything you hear right now. The biggest stars of Fox News are about to face their most important audience yet. Expected to testify before jurors in what will be a sensational trial. A test of whether peddling a conspiracy theory comes with a price tag of $1.6 billion U.S. We have tremendous evidence already but we, uh, of fraud in this election. Fox News is being sued over its post-2020 election coverage for broadcasting conspiracy theories and lies about electronic voting machines made by Dominion Voting Systems, a Canadian-founded company. Electronic voting machines didn't allow people to vote, apparently. It aired false accusations the electronic machines were rigged to take votes away from Donald Trump and that they were controlled by people in Venezuela, claims debunked by the company's founder. We were founded in Toronto, which is where my family was from, and, and there was nothing to do with Venezuela. Lawyers for Dominion will try to prove Fox knowingly spread false information, which is typically a high legal bar to meet. Did Fox News know what they were saying about Dominion was false, or did they act with reckless disregard to whether it was true or false? In the lead-up to the trial, a stunning trove of emails and text messages were released, showing high-profile hosts didn't believe the claims they broadcast, while executives, including 92-year-old Rupert Murdoch, did not intervene. Fox says its coverage is protected by First Amendment free speech rights and that it was covering unprecedented claims of widespread voter fraud by the president and that a loss would be devastating for journalism in general. I'm surprised if they didn't settle. Uh, I think they'll probably lose. The cynicism and the outright lying is so crazy here. Katie is near the courthouse where this trial was supposed to get underway tomorrow. So, Katie, what do we know about why now this sudden delay? The speculation is perhaps this dispute, this high-profile dispute, might actually be settled out of court. According to the Wall Street Journal, which of course is part of the Rupert Murdoch media empire, is saying that Fox has made a last-minute push to try to reach some sort of settlement, according to sources familiar with the situation. Given all of the evidence that has been released so far, there had been concerns from analysts that might be the best option for Fox News. All right, Katie Simpson in Delaware tonight. Thank you. Authorities in Alabama confirmed four people were killed after a shooting at a teen's birthday party. At least 28 people were injured. Still no word on a suspect in the mass shooting. The violence, a sudden wound on this community of 3,000. Local police not immune to the shock. There were four lives, not fatalities, lives. There were four lives tragically lost in this incident. Do not let this moment define what you think about the city of Dayville and our fine people. But it does define this moment in Dadeville. The what shooter happened? struck last night at the party. What happened? Maya got shot in the face and Maya's covered in blood. But information on how or why is scarce. Yeah, somebody in there that had a gun. Somehow I walk in with a gun and just open up fire, you know, for no reason. You know, nice party, nice family. Just one of them things. Just one of those things. Another mass shooting in the U.S. added to a growing list now approaching 150 so far this year. In Ukraine tonight, Orthodox Christians are marking their second Easter since Russia's invasion. Troops and civilians attended an outdoor church service near the besieged city of Bakhmut. While these Ukrainian soldiers observed the occasion closer to the front lines. Further west, locals combed the rubble of a church hit by a Russian missile, one of hundreds destroyed in the war. Elsewhere, fighters from both sides were reportedly sent home in an Easter prisoner exchange. Back here in this country, it could be an uneasy start to the commute tomorrow in Metro Vancouver. There was another stabbing this weekend on the transit system just days after a teenager was killed on a bus in Surrey. 
Georgie Smythe with the reaction tonight. For Vancouver Public Transit riders, another random attack has only raised anxiety and calls for solutions to the spate of violence on the system. I think I'm trying not to make eye contact with people and just sort of have a little bubble around myself. Yeah. I, I see you've got a big hood on. Yeah, too, is it? <laughs> thick material, knife can't penetrate as easily. <laughs> is that honestly what goes through your mind? It is, sadly. I'm, I feel so threatened because I hear the news, so yeah. This weekend, another stabbing on Metro Vancouver Transit, the third this month. While the victim is expected to recover, it comes just days after 17-year-old Ethan Bepsflug was stabbed to death on a bus in Surrey. I haven't read any articles or watched any of the news or anything. I just, I can't. It makes it real and I don't want it to be real. Police have promised to boost patrols around transit hubs. It's a tactic that did bring violent incidents down on the TTC in Toronto. As many cities across the country grapple with violence on their transit systems, there's a growing awareness of how gaps in mental health services might play a role. The system itself has become a, a de facto shelter, a social service agency, and people are, I'll say, flocking to the transit because we don't have enough shelter space. Researchers say helping people in crisis is key to helping others stay safe. There are these underlying things that we need to get at. Otherwise, anything and everything that we're going to be doing is, is going to be, um, you know, it's just band-aid work and we're not going to solve any problems. In BC, transit unions are calling on the province to step in and make a plan to solve this crisis for the long term. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. A snowmobiler is dead after getting caught in an avalanche near the BC-Alberta border. It happened yesterday near Whirlpool Lake, about three hours west of Calgary. Avalanche Canada says two riders were caught in the avalanche. One ended up buried about two meters deep. That person was taken by helicopter to Invermere, BC, but did not survive. This brings the number of people killed by avalanches in BC to 14 since January. There's growing concern tonight that farming in Canada is in jeopardy. A new report says the country needs to bring in 30,000 immigrants to fill jobs in the industry. But is Canada ready to support that big wave? Sam Sampson got some answers. This year it was wheat. And Rehan Khan is no stranger to the farm life. He was a farmer and worked in agricultural science in Pakistan for two decades. For him, starting a farm in Canada was the natural move. But he warns other newcomers it's not easy. Unfortunately, in the very beginning, uh, couldn't find so much information for this thing. Uh, but later, I mean, now I know everything. <laughs> now I know, I mean, how to buy something, from where to buy, where would be the, we'd get the less price. Khan hopes it's easier for future migrants, especially since he and others are a key part of Canada's farming future. A recent report shows 40% of Canadian farmers will retire within 10 years. There's also an expected shortage of 24,000 farm, nursery and greenhouse workers. To fill the gap, researchers say Canada needs 30,000 immigrants who can either start up their own operations or take over existing ones. One solution? Make it easier for experienced temporary foreign workers to become permanent residents. We're also talking about radically new forms of agriculture like, uh, like the explosion of the greenhouse industry over the last, say, 20 years. <laughs> they need a workforce year-round. So the very play. notion of a temporary migrant worker that comes in simply for the growing season doesn't really even make sense. This is not a cheap industry. In many areas, a million-dollar budget won't even buy a small farm. So some newcomers are frozen out from the get-go. We get lots of calls of people who are eager to start, but there's that gap there between what they can afford and what they're actually going for. There are provinces like Saskatchewan that have programs specifically to attract egg-focused immigrants to the sector. There is also a federal pilot project which speeds up the permanent resident process for farm-focused newcomers, but that ends in May. This year I did basically this soil sampling. and Khan wants to see organized local advice for newcomers on everything from machinery rentals to hauling grain. All these things should be uh, considered not only for the immigrant but for the agency, for the immigration department who wants to get farmers in over here. Khan hopes to build a house on this land to truly make Canada his family's home. Sam Sampson, CBC News, near Yorkton, Saskatchewan. While Canada may be in need of more immigration, some are taking dangerous steps to get here. 
An exclusive look inside a fishing vessel destined for Canada but left to drift in the ocean. It is all or nothing now. One game to go at the Women's World. Team Canada goes for gold again, but despite their success, why women's hockey struggles to fill seats. What people have to understand is women's hockey is not a charity. It is a professional business. And... Julie Black speaks about the big impact of a small change. But getting their blessing is what made me go through with it. We're back in two. For so many people desperate for a better life, Canada is a dream destination. Some turn to human smugglers to get them in, but those journeys can be harrowing, even deadly. Jonathan Gatehouse brings us the exclusive story of one group destined for BC and takes us on board their boat, a fishing vessel, as it starts to sink. <laughs> This was the scene last November aboard the Lady 3, a Myanmar-flagged fishing vessel packed with 303 Tamil men, women and children, abandoned by the crew and left to sink hundreds of kilometers off the coast of Vietnam. The would-be refugees aboard paid $5,000 each for the trip to Canada's west coast, told by smugglers that they would be sailing on a cruise liner. <laughs> Finding instead a barely seaworthy ship with little to eat and drink, no sleeping quarters and just two toilets. <laughs> In the end, they save themselves, says this man, since repatriated home to Sri Lanka. A passing Japanese cargo ship took them aboard and they were brought to refugee camps in Vietnam. Kirunatharan Mathushin says he was fleeing harassment from police and the military, lured by visions of an easier life. These migrants fell more than 12,000 kilometers short of their goal, despite spending a full month at sea. Their plan to travel across the open Pacific sounds improbable, except for the fact that it has happened before. The Sun Sea's long trip across the Pacific ended just before dawn. In 2009 and 10, the Canadian Navy intercepted two ships full of Tamil asylum seekers off Vancouver Island. Successful crossings used as a selling point for last November's attempt. 13 years ago, Nathan Tharmalingam, his wife and their three young children arrived aboard the MV Sun Sea, enduring similar dangers, cramped conditions and scarce food, all for the chance to land on Canada's not so welcoming shore. Are you surprised that people still want to try to make that dangerous trip in a boat? <laughs> This expert says vast travel distances don't deter desperate people. There will be no silver bullet and no perfect solution. The truth is we cannot manage migration 100%. We can try to manage it better, but we should also be honest that, you know, the world is very dynamic. Mathujan still wants to leave Sri Lanka, although he has a warning for others who might be enticed by smugglers' promises. Jonathan, did the federal government know about this ship? Well, the answer appears to be no. We asked Sean Fraser, the Federal Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, about the Lady Three's voyage. His department was unaware that the boat was bound for Canada. 
until this week when we told them and sent them some copies of stories from the international media and comments from Sri Lankan officials. Which is surprising because, David, as you might remember, when those migrant ships arrived in 2009 and 10, it was a big political headache for Stephen Harper's government, and there was considerable debate about what to do with those Tamil asylum seekers. But at the end of the day, two-thirds of them, 378 of the 568 people aboard those two vessels, ended up being accepted by Canada as refugees. All right. Jonathan Gatehouse, thank you. Thank you. Singer Julie Black is speaking out about a moment that changed her life. The singer's candid conversation about what happened after O Canada. They gave me permission to know that I'm enough. And... The masked phantom disappears from the stage for the final time. We will not see this again on Broadway, a show with a cast this size, with a crew this size. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next. Many know her as the queen of R&B, She's considered one of Canada's greatest singers. For over two decades, Julie Black has been instrumental in growing Canadian hip hop and R&B. Her lasting success has inspired and uplifted fans and she's become a leading voice for black Canadians. Then, at the NBA All-Star Game, on one of the world's biggest stages, she used her platform to send a message to all Canadians by singing these words. Our home on a native land. Black's small but impactful tweet to O Canada made international headlines, stirring up conversation about whether her rendition should be made official. We are experiencing life on Native land, on Indigenous land. She was honoured by the Assembly of First Nations and celebrated for her alliance to the Indigenous community. I recently sat down with Julie Black to talk about her experience. I know enough about you to know that this didn't come just as a whim, mm -hmm. that you are close to people in the Indigenous community. Yes. And you had a discussion and that's what prompted action. Yeah, well, it actually flipped around. So I got, I woke with the feeling of how do I make this moment meaningful? How do I make this opportunity um, impactful for all of Canada? Like I'm representing Canada. To me, it's like the Olympics of anthems. <laughs> I'm representing Canada on the world stage. And so when that, when it dawned on me, like, oh, okay, I went through, I went through the anthem word for word. And I'm like, okay. It just didn't feel right, and I followed the feeling. And then, you know, there's appropriation, then there's appreciation. So that's when I, I contacted a few of my friends who are Indigenous. And so, but getting their blessing is what made me go through with it. Because had, had I not received their blessing, it would have been, it would have felt self-serving. Mm. You perform it, a lot of people hear it, mm -hmm. and a lot of people start talking about it. And... That includes within the Indigenous community, within the Assembly of First Nations, which then holds this special chief's assembly at which you're honoured. Mm -hmm. An emotional event for you. Even now I'm holding tears. Emotional, spiritual, bridge building, healing. It was all the things that I've I've needed for myself for the little girl Julie Julianne and Dara Gordon, because being especially being an R and B singer and being a black woman in this country, born and raised, my experiences has been okay. I've done this. What's next? Like I was inducted into Walk of Fame. Okay, what's next? It's almost like okay, what's next? It never felt like anything was ever enough. Whew. Wow, yeah. And they they just gave me. They gave me permission to know that I'm enough. I can see the emotion there. Yeah. yeah, I'm enough. I matter. You said during that ceremony, 
on behalf of the black community, mm -hmm. we are one. We're better together. Tell me about that. So many years ago, I heard this term BIPOC. And whoever invented the term, okay, whatever. Black indigenous people of color. I recognize that I've been going through life kind of walking down this, it's like we're, it's like if you, if you envision like the lanes of a, of a track and we're, we're running against each other, we're supposed to be really running on the same team, but this whole BIPOC thing is like we're running against each other. And so that's why in that moment, I'm so happy I, I, it dawned on me to say it as an audible. If I don't live to see reparations for black people, I can live to see and help and support be a part of the change for indigenous peoples and feel just as fulfilled. Because at the end of the day, I am not feeling the plight of my ancestors in real time right now. Mm -hmm. But I have indigenous friends who know people that don't have clean water, like right now. You've spoken about indigenous rights for a long time. Mm -hmm. I go back to um, 2018, Canada Reads. Mm -hmm. You were defending the Marrow Thieves yeah. um, by indigenous author Sherry Demoline. If I can, mm -hmm. I want to show you that defense. Oh wow, you actually have it. Yeah. Oh wow. You hit play. Oh my goodness, you guys really didn't get me here. Waking up this morning and seeing on the news that um, Pope Francis decided not to apologize to Canadian Indigenous people for the residential schools when in 2015 they apologized to the American Indigenous people. Like, it's this, this is real life. You know, I don't, it's a show and mm. you know, all the books are amazing, but I, re I remember being uh, youth that was seen and not heard. And, um, you know, my mom worked for $1.65 an hour here in Canada and made life for all her kids. And for me to be here and be able to represent a community um, that simply wants a conversation to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a big deal for Canada, man. My mom chose Canada. Oh. Whoo. My mom chose Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Your mom's not with us anymore. Yeah. Not physically. No. So tell me <laughs> what, what she is inside you that has made you the person who advocates, who knows marginalized communities and has continued to struggle and, and fight for those communities? Yeah, my mom taught me forgiveness, first and foremost, it's the gateway to freedom. And without that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have enough love available to want to be on the front line, to want to take on this role or this, you know, my mom would say like, the mantle is open, there's a mantle for you, just step on it, step up. She didn't let shame stop her, and that's what she taught me, to shame the shame, you know? So I had to go through it, and I'm still going through it now in therapy, and to really heal the little girl, and talk about my experiences, talk about surviving child sexual abuse, talking about mom raising us as a single parent, you know? But I share it, I share it in my keynotes, I'll share it on television, I'll share it anywhere, because I really want my, my history doesn't have to be my destiny. Hmm. Like, why not speak positively? when we can, we have it available to us. And so that's how she lives through me every single day. This conversation that you've brought to the fore, mm -hmm. if that actually resulted in change, we all sang the anthem as you <laughs> sang the anthem, what would that mean to you? I'm still sitting with that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, in this moment, it wouldn't mean anything for me, but it would mean something to me that they're listening. But for it to be a legitimate conversation that's truth telling, that's huge for the generation coming up. Because they'll they'll know that to be the truth mm -hmm. and learn that. And so I, I think it's important that it, it resonates. It's it is we are on native land, like that's we are on indigenous land. If I could have changed two words, I would have done home on indigenous land. But you know, you choose which one would be to me the most impactful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not here to wave my wand and be like, if you don't do this, then you're wrong. 
you know, I it, it took 45 years to be 45 years old, and so I'm I'm sitting in my in my maturity and wanting to learn more about Indigenous peoples. Quite the conversation uh, with a very impressive woman who has made her mark and continues to do so on many, many communities across this country. After more than three decades, a Broadway classic disappears into the night and... Towards Canada with control. Fast looking net from two Team Canada racks up the medals. Why it's not enough to attract more fans. Next. It's a big night on Broadway. The Phantom of the Opera has completed its last show, capping an incredible 35-year stretch. That makes it the longest-running musical in Broadway history. On top of its longevity, the Phantom of the Opera is also unique in its scale, and as Chris Reyes shows us, many people view tonight as the end of an era. Let your soul take you where you long to be. There's no mistaking, Phantom of the Opera was born in the 80s. Lavish, dramatic, and over the top. What no one could have predicted back then that the show would outlive that decade, and then some. Becoming a fixture in a fickle industry where shows can open and close in one season. Phantom's contemporaries on Broadway have long shut down. Cats, Les Mis. I've been so fortunate to be a part of this, and I've loved it uh, every step of the way. Canadian actor Laird McIntosh played Phantom both on Broadway and in Toronto. The show's history has left a mark on his own life story. I met my wife in this show. She's been in the show for almost 20 years now. A lot of the high points in my career have, have been as a result of being in this show. Tonight, it all came to an end after more than 13,000 shows at the Majestic Theatre. For the performers, deep gratitude. What are your parting words for this show? I'm so grateful and for having this in my life and it being able to keep me here. Thank you for keeping the consistency <laughs> in my life. <laughs> I've done a little bit over 1,200 shows, which as an opera singer would never, I mean, that's like a full career. From opera singers to dancers to lighting technicians and crew, it takes 130 people to put on each performance. The show's producers have cited the pandemic's impact and the show's high cost as the main reasons for shutting it down. Audiences have responded, spiking ticket sales and giving Phantom its best weeks in 35 years. You're going out with a bang. Absolutely. You're going out with a chandelier yes, drop. Yes, we are. Yeah. But many say it's the kind of Broadway show that may never come back. We will not see this again on Broadway, a show with a cast this size, with a crew this size, with a full orchestra this big. Um, and with a gigantic set. It's like I'm losing a part of my family, not to sound morbid, but it is a little bit like a death. This is so much more than just a job. An exit as dramatic as its debut. Chris Reyes joins us now from the Majestic Theatre on Broadway. And Chris, this final performance came with a Canadian twist, a lot of fanfare, and you were just inside for the final curtain call. And well, it was very cool to witness theater history, and inside it was pretty special with none other than legendary composer Andrew Lloyd Webber taking center stage. He thanked the fans, he thanked New York, and outside of the theater, you can also feel the electricity with all the super fans waiting for just about anybody to come out. They're holding their playbills, and you mentioned that Canadian twist. Canadian actor Laird McIntosh ended up playing Phantom in this final show because the current Phantom was sick. And then I know many theater fans are asking, is this really the end? A little tease for An from Andrew Lloyd Webber, who said that all the great musicals eventually come back. So you never know. You never know. Chris Reyes on The Great White Way, thank you. Thank you. 
Canada's hopes of winning a third straight gold medal at the IIHF Women's World Championship have also come to an end tonight. Heads into Canada's end. It's over. The United States is back on top. Team Canada losing 6-3 to three against the U.S. in the final. The win gives the Americans their 10th gold medal in the tournament. The other 12 have all gone to Canadian clubs. This year, Canada settles for silver. Despite the success of both Canadian and American players on the ice, there's still concern about the overall state of the women's game in North America. Jamie Strachan shows us why. Hi. At this arena in Toronto, Hi. these young girls are working on the game they love. I'm here to have fun and meet new people. What's the hardest thing about being a goalie? Um, probably pushing side to side. Get there really, really Pro player Nicole Costa marvels at the strength of girls hockey at the grassroots level and how it's grown exponentially in recent years. There's a lot more ice time for them, there's a lot more female groups, you know, so they can grow together, compete against each other in practice all the time, so that's huge. I'm not surprised to see where it's at, I'm excited. But whether the best of these girls will one day play professionally is an ongoing issue. After big events like the Olympics or World Championships, women's hockey has struggled to sustain mainstream interest. People have to understand is women's hockey is, is not a charity. It is a, a, a professional business. Brenda Andrus was the commissioner of the Canadian Women's Hockey League, which collapsed in 2019. You need the fans to come to the game to pay the dollars. You need the sponsorships to come so you have the sponsorship. You need the, you know, the broadcasting, the streaming rights. There's currently one professional women's league in North America, the Premier Hockey Federation. It features seven teams, including two Canadian clubs. Two shots on net for Team Sonnet on the power play. But most of the world's best are part of the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association, a separate group that currently plays showcase games across North America though it says it's working on creating a league of its own. I think there's an opportunity to come together, an opportunity to drive the sport forward faster. Experts say one unified North American women's league could thrive if it's approached in the right way. I think the challenge with the leagues, any incarnation, is they have not been fan-centric. They've led with lots of other things, sponsorship and equality and parity, which are all good. But if you don't put fans first and make that priority number one, the revenues tend not to come. Jamie, it wasn't Team Canada's night tonight. Uh, no, definitely not, David. Things were looking really good. They were winning 3-2 uh, heading into the third period, but four unanswered goals from the United States sealed the fate in this 6-3 victory for the United States. They say the best players rise to the occasion in the biggest games, and that was the case tonight. U.S. Captain Hillary Knight had a hat trick in this game. And really, this rivalry between these two teams become, has become one of the great in all of sports. 176th time these two teams have met. The latest chapter in this battle going to the United States. David? All right. Thanks very much, Jamie Strachan. Next, a man offering relief when spring suddenly feels like summer. And I eat ice cream every day for 59 years. The truck serving swirls for more than half a century. That's next. You're looking at James Vavarutsis, who's been serving ice cream for nearly 60 years, and it's been especially welcome this past week in Toronto as temperatures rose to near record levels. Thankfully, Uncle Jimmy, as he's affectionately known, was out serving waffle cones. And at 84, he's not planning to stop anytime soon. Tonight, his passion for soft serve is our moment. Uncle Jimmy's. Uh, Uncle Jimmy's. Right here, you see it? I came to Canada 64, and I started working as an ice cream man since then. You see the good ice cream, look. See? <laughs> Opa! <laughs> and I eat ice cream every day for 59 years. I bought this truck before I married my wife. The, my first truck was $12,500, brand new. Now it's only the machine, $50,000. Only the machine. 
Muchas gracias. My wife is gone now. The truck is still here. Talk about you. And I'm still doing it. Okay. Thank you. I love my job. I raised my family, four kids. And now they, they come and help me. If you like what you're doing, you can make it do a good job. What's the most requested uh, product? Twist, two in one, chocolate and vanilla. Fresh cream, fresh milk. No powder stuff. Look at that. He asked me when I quit. And I told him when my feet collapse, I quit. <laughs> Well, I had the chance to chat with uh, Uncle Jimmy earlier in the week. Went down today, and yes, got myself an ice cream. There it is, with Uncle Jimmy, 84 years old. Amazing guy, so much fun. Glad to meet him, and sorry if in your part of the world it's been snowing. That is The National for April 16th. Thanks very much for being with us. Have a great night.